It's Speaking With Gravity, a podcast where we talk about mental health and how everything affects everything. Each episode, the goal is to have a conversation that will make you think, make you feel, and make you do what is best for you. This isn't therapy, it's just a podcast. And I am Kervin. I'm Joshua. I'm Bill. And today we're talking politics. Yep. Things everyone should know when talking about politics. And, you know, this is a a podcast, obviously, about mental health. And people might say, what in the world do politics have to do with the mental health? Mm. But, you know, one of our mantras um, is everything affects everything, even politics. Uh, so we're going to begin off with what we do all the time. We have a Twitter discussion, and in essence, we get something from the Internet. Uh, I named it Twitter Discussions. I probably need to change it to Internet Discussions. Um, but today, there's a quote from James Baldwin that Josh is going to share with us because he wants to do it in Baldwin's um, voice. Yeah, I mean, James Baldwin, you know... Uh Really pivotal character, I think, when you think about, um, just when you think about distinguishable, distinguishable minds, like great minds. Uh, go back and check out some of his stuff. But uh, to a discussion day comes from him. Had to do it in his voice, uh, right, because his voice is so distinguishable. So bear with me. If, if James Baldwin was here, this is how he would say this statement. I love America more than any other country in this world. And... Exactly for this reason, I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually. Yeah. You, Is that you, not how he was saying <laughs> it? It was similar. I'm, I'm going to say you gave it some justice. Um, okay. Um, better than I could do it. Yeah, so yeah maybe, definitely maybe, better than I could do it. Maybe there's a future in acting there, possibly. No. Uh, <laughs> we're not going to go that far. But well, you, know, you got to start somewhere. Yeah. Right? Gotta start somewhere. And harsh truths being spoken on this show. Always. He's a very harsh character, though. Always. You should have heard what he said about his, uh, Yeah. Um, But to go back to this I love America more than any other country In this world And exactly for that reason I insist on the right to criticize her perpetually Mm. Um, I think sometimes we As a society get confused With um, Criticism, constructive or otherwise As if we don't love something Or we don't have any care for it Um, I personally Would not at this state in my life would not want to live anywhere else. No, I don't know if I'm going to see stuff later in a, um, later down the line, if I'm going to go to another country and say, all right, I'm, I'm cool with living there. But right now, I love America. Mm-hmm. I also hate some of the things that, that, that goes on, have went on, um, and still going on. Um, Listen, most of us don't exactly have a choice. As to what country we live in. Right? Yes. I mean, that's the reality. Right. Millions of people born in the United States. This is where we live. This is where we're going to die. And that's, that's just a fact of life. It's a very few that actually get the freedom to go explore the world and pick a country. Kind of like your family. Yeah. You were born into your family. You didn't get to pick your mom and your dad right. and your siblings. You were born into it. So as a member of this family we call the United States of America, you're darn right we have the right to criticize it. And not just to be critical, because you want it to be the best it can be. I'm going to criticize my brother. I'm going to criticize my sister. I'm going to criticize my grandparents and my parents, and I'm going to love the heck out of them while I do it, because that is the right of being a family member. How is being a member of this country any different? And then when I, you go online, and there are certain words that I feel have been co-opted and abused, words like patriot. (laughs) <laughs> words like um, love our country you know mm-hmm. they say I love our country but not the people in it that's what I hear a lot wow you know? so if you're a, of a different religion or maybe no religion or you have a different uh, a sexual orientation or a different style of living or a different political belief those people who say I love our country do they though Do they love our country, which is made up of diversity and thought and color and creed? You know, that's where I feel like some of those phrases just sometimes rub me the wrong way because they're used in 
a very accusatory matter. You know, I'm a patriot. Well, we're all patriots. We all love our, I love our country. Especially when the next phrase after it is, well, why don't you go back where you came from? Mm-hmm. How often have you heard that phrase? I hear it too often. I've heard it while I was running for office last year. Oh, wow. Why don't you go back if you don't... To you? If, yeah. If you think South Carolina has so many problems, why don't you go back? Where are you originally from? Well, I was born in Philadelphia. Okay. I've lived in Illinois. Well, don't go back. We like you here. I've lived in Virginia. Yeah. Now, this is the United States. Right. Right. People will move. Now, I've lived here since 2012, and now I pay taxes for 11 years. I feel like I've got some right to speak about the state of South Carolina. Not that I think South Carolina is a terrible state. It's a wonderful state. Look at these two wonderful people sitting next to me here. Well, thank but you, you got to have some right to speak up and make it as best as it can be because I plan on staying here and retiring here. And, and speaking up gives accountability to those who are um, in charge or who have been um, elected. Um, speaking of South Carolina being a, a great state, I remember, uh, I think I was in, I was traveling, going to, I think I was in Florida, and somebody looked at my tag and said, oh, that's God's country. No, uh, I'd never heard of that before Amen. at that time. Um, but actually, I was oddly, I was proud. Uh, that was a proud moment for me <laughs> for them to say that's God's country. So you know, I, I like, I like love South Carolina as well. Don't like everything that's that's a part of it uh, all the time. But going back to what you're, um, what. Um, James Baldwin was saying what you were saying. Uh, I have a right to criticize. I have a right to challenge those um, who are in authority or who've been elected or who are in in um, in power, so to Kirvin, speak. I'm going to take it one step further. I think it's good to say I have a right to criticize. Mm-hmm. I also say you have a duty to mm-hmm. get involved and make it better. If you're just going to sit in the couch and type on your keyboard and issue criticism after yeah. criticism, <laughs> man, you're not doing anybody any good. Yeah. But if you're out there at any capacity, joining a social club, uh, informing people, educating, helping get the word out, whatever. All right, now you get to play in the game mm-hmm. and you've earned that right to speak. Because so I think it's got to be more than just being the critic. You've got to be an activist as well at any level, whether it's at 1% or 100%. You've got to be involved. All right, Josh, give us the QD of the hour. I know you gave us Twitter discussions. Give us QD of the hour so we can get into this. Yeah, definitely. Uh, QD of the hour. Quotable data, another version of fun facts, info for you to be able to give your friends, family, colleagues, co-workers, and church members. Now take out that word mental right though. Okay. QD of the hour. Thanks. 60, 61 women of color currently serve in Congress as voting and non-voting members. All but nine of the 61 are Democrats. Mm. Now, I don't, I don't really know what to make of that stat, Bill. Um, 61 women of color currently serve um, in Congress as voting or non-voting. What, what is non-voting member? You've got territories like Guam, uh, or even you've got the District of Columbia, Washington, D.C., which is not a state. They have representation. They okay. can participate in discussions, but they're not allowed to vote. Okay. Have you ever heard of the um, the rallying cry uh, statehood for D.C. or D.C. statehood? Mm-hmm. It's a topic that comes up every once in a while. There's millions of people living in Washington, D.C., more so than several states in this country. Mm-hmm. Yet none of them have a representative who can vote for their interest in Congress. So what do, they, what do they do, Jess? They're there to kind of, I guess, bring awareness to... Bring awareness, inform, keep okay. their electorates informed, um, maybe even participate in some discussions, but at the end of the day, uh, those millions of people living in Washington, D.C. don't have a voice mm. that's, that's a voting voice. Mm. And so, wow. I, you know, they, they say that, uh, you know, statehood for Washington, D.C. is a liberal <clears throat> ploy, but this country was founded on, you know, no taxation without representation. And when you got millions of people, not just in Washington, D.C., but also in, in Puerto Rico and in Guam and other territories of the United States who don't have that elected voice, that doesn't sit right with me. It's like colonialism. And, and you know what? They could be the most Republican voices in the world, and I'd still just say, say the same thing. Mm-hmm. You know, I think if you're paying taxes, you ought to have voting representation. Is Absolutely. that not like colonialism, almost? Yeah. All right. I mean, Go ahead. I was, I was going to say, I, I just wanted to ask Bill, um, and so I know you're the Democratic chair. That's right. You know, uh, here. Uh, w- wanted to ask, um, 
so being part of the Democratic Party, being the chair of the Democratic Party in such a conservative uh, area, I know we talked about it earlier, but yeah, could you just enlighten us on your experience as the Democratic chair in such a conservative area? Well, be- before you do that, did we even introduce him? I don't think so. That's why <laughs> oh, I tried to say Democratic oh, chair. My, my bad. I mean? Bill, um, uh, answer his question, definitely. But before but chair, you yeah, answer that, yeah, can sir. you just give us who you are, why you're here? Well, not why you're here, but who you are Please. and what, what, what you're about. So we'll start with the formal introduction. Yeah. Hello, my name is Bill. <laughs> there you go. Uh, Bill Kimmler. Glad to have you here, Bill. Thank you very much. Uh, I came to Greenwood in 2012 out of love. My wife was born and raised here in Greenwood. God's country, right? That's right. Uh, and I felt it the moment I walked in. And, and I tell you what, this was such a wonderful, welcoming place uh, that I decided to uproot and relocate. Now, I've got two grown children of my own. They're in their mm-hmm. mid-20s, and they're living their lives, and they gave me the freedom to go ahead and move <laughs> 800 miles across the country, so here I am. Mm. Uh, I am an accidental politician, meaning mm. that for most of my life, I never really was concerned about politics. Really? I had my kids. I raised my family. I paid taxes. Uh, did I pay attention to school boards? Did I pay attention to the mayor's race? Did I pay attention to even Congress? No, I did not. Really? Um, I, I was just busy living my life. And maybe, you know, I voted every election. Don't get me wrong. Mm-hmm. But once you get past the president and vice president, I'll be honest, I didn't really know a lot of those names below that. Mm-hmm. And then in 2016, um, and I'll call those the Donald Trump days, uh, that's really when I would say my eyes got opened. And it wasn't open just at the federal level. I started seeing how things were playing out here. And I'll tell you the moment that I had what I'll call my awakening. So it was 2017, January 2017, and anti-immigration fervor was sweeping the nation. Mm. And one of the very first acts Donald Trump did as president was the so-called Muslim travel ban, Mm -hmm. where he stopped on a dime all travel uh, from countries that were primarily Muslim throughout the world. And and for no reason, really. I mean, he just said, I'm going to put a 90-day travel moratorium just to see what's going on. Well, what happened was I got caught up in an article from a a young woman uh, from Clemson University. She was a graduate student in data science. Over the winter, she went to Iran to visit her family, her grandmother, you know, and other relatives, an annual trip that she always made. And she got caught up in that travel ban. Mm. She was out there just visiting family, and next thing she knows, she couldn't get back. Wow. Her life was here. Her, she, she was a, a full-time student. She had a dog. She had an apartment. Her car was in the parking lot at the airport. And now she, she was stuck. Mm. No way to get In fact, she was on a plane getting ready to fly back home when she was pulled off that flight and said, sorry, ma'am, you cannot travel. Mm. And, and for no other reason than she was in a country mm. uh, you know, on this list. And to me, that just sounded so cruel and unfair, and it brought home the fact that a decision made by some dude in Washington, supported by a bunch of people who put him in there, can have a direct impact on you, even though you're just an innocent bystander. And I was like, man, I I can't, you know, for my own kids and for my family, I can't remain quiet. So I started getting involved, and I even checked out our local congressman, Jeff Duncan, to see what was he doing to help? Nothing. I started seeing some of the vitriol. Was he even aware that? Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah, he was fully supportive of it. But the fact that some of his own constituents were caught up in it, didn't register for him at all. Mm. I started looking at some of the local representatives at the state house and, and just seeing the what I'll call the nastiness, the bitterness on their own posts, the lack of professionalism, the lack of the fact that, hey, I represent all of you and not just the few of you that, that got me in here. To me, that just rubbed me such mm-hmm. the wrong way that I was like, all right, I'm gonna get involved. So. I signed up to the local Democratic Party, went to my first meeting. It was packed wall to wall. I would say maybe 120 people in attendance over at in on the square. Wow. And uh, I was like, this is neat. I offered my services as a secretary because I was good with websites. I was good with social media and uh, started helping out. Next thing I know in 2020, I became the chair. I was Mm -hmm. elected chair, and um, that's where I am today. And that's, um, I became a somewhat involved at that point. Um, my brother, I was always a Democrat, registered Democrat, um, but that's, that's as far as it went. I was just registered. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then my brother uh, dragged me out to 
and meeting, and, and I got valuable information. And each time I go out, um, which I don't make it every single month, but each time I go out, there's valuable information that's being put out. Because, you know, a lot of times when you see them, you see HR not, you know, 32, or, and it, it'll have a long uh, title, and then it'll say Bill. And, you know, you, you can get confused, just, oh, okay, you know, or not even understand it. You know, it, it depends on how the media puts it, brings it out. Mm-hmm. But when you, uh, at least when you go to um, the Democratic uh, breakfast here, it's explained thoroughly what this bill is addressing and how it's, it could possibly um, affect people. Do y'all do like outreach as well? Like get out into, because I know y'all have that, yeah. that meeting. Um, can you speak about that, what that outreach looks like? Because um, hearing what it's done for Curvin, Right, mm-hmm. how it's opened your eyes to some of the things and how some of those bills are explained, you know, because I feel like a lot comes down pipeline and we don't understand, like you were saying, uh, the consequences of not voting on this, right? <laughs> of just letting nothing happen. So, can you speak about uh, maybe some of the outreach you all do to create awareness? I think that question you raised is probably the single most important question of our mm-hmm. time is that outreach. Mm-hmm. Because as important as I've come to realize it, remember, I spent most of my, not, my life not realizing it. Yeah. And it took a so many of us for me to wake up. Well, there's still a lot of people who don't think politics applies to them. Mm-hmm. Were you, when you say you, uh, you spent many years not just voting, were you running from that information or was it just not kind of brought to your attention in a certain manner? Listen, it needs to be a two-way street. So, you know... It, a party or a political group needs to make themselves known to the people. Right. You know, a candidate running for office mm-hmm. needs to be in the streets getting to know the people, getting the message out. At the same time, it should be the responsibility of the citizens to be informed as to who are my representatives, who are my officials, uh, what are the issues of the day. And I will say to you, both sides don't do the best job at that. So to answer your question, what are we doing? Mm-hmm. We are... Um, we have always tried to participate in community activities. For example, there's a Juneteenth event that happens every summer put on by the Greenwood Garveyites. Mm-hmm. We usually have a booth set up there okay. and try to hand out information, talk to people, get them engaged, and, and let them know. Now, we'll tell you, for 100 people that walk past us, two or three will stop by and engage. Mm-hmm. You know, We need that to be 100 people stopping by and mm-hmm. engaging. They don't have to agree with everything we say, but they should at least be informed as to what's going on. Mm -hmm. We're also going to be going a lot more out into the communities this year. I think Um, that's big. You know, I want to share something with you. I want to come back to your um, quotable data. Yes. So you talked about how in the U.S. Congress that a majority, by far majority of black representatives fall within the Democratic Party. And there's historical and even current reasons for that. I want to localize that data for you a little bit more. Please I want to talk about South Carolina. Mm-hmm. All right, so for South Carolina, 20% of South Carolina residents are black. Mm-hmm. All right, it's, it's you know, more than one out of four. Go back in 2020, 26% of the General Assembly, the legislators, the House and the Senate, 26% were black representatives. Okay. So, okay, you know what? That's good. Mm-hmm. Two years later, that number has dropped below 22%. So just in one election, we lost a considerable percentage of black representatives in South Carolina, and now it's unbalanced. Mm -hmm. Let me throw another fact at you. Let's talk about women. More than half of South Carolina is female, 51 point some percent. You want to take a guess as to what percentage of the General Assembly is female? In 2020, it was 16 percent. Wow. Mm. Two years later, after this last election in November, it's down to 14.6. Mm. 14.6 lawmakers, percent of lawmakers, are women. More than half the state are women. You talk about people who can represent you, understand you, know about your issues, decide on things like women's reproductive rights, mm-hmm. when over 80% <laughs> of them are men who don't have women's right. reproductive parts. Does that yeah. sound right? No. The South Carolina State Supreme Court the, one, the highest lawmaking body in the state, or the law, the, the highest judicial Judicial's body bill. in the state, mm-hmm. all male. Five men. Did not know that. Five men. This is the only state 
in the country that has an all-male Supreme Court. Mm. So you talk about you know, some quotable data. Uh, South Carolina is way off kilter um, you know, to an extent by race, but definitely by gender. It is way off. And we see the effect of that as the laws are coming down that will regulate how we live, what we can do and what we can't do being imposed upon us by a body that does not look like us. And I say that as a middle-aged white man, right? So I've, I've got a certain you know, a, a position on this, but I see it, the numbers. I'm a numbers guy. My background is technology and data. That's where I came from. Mm -hmm. And the numbers are telling me a hard truth and that's what's got me motivated every day. The, the stress of following um, daily political news um, can negatively affect us, or our mental health and well-being. Um, but disengaging has its own ramifications as well. Uh, Dr. Brett Ford, um, he shared political politics isn't just something that affects people every four years during election season. It seems to seep into daily life but we just don't know how much about the day-to-day -day impact politics make. Um, for people like Bill, all the facts that he just gave us, who wish to get people more involved in advocating for political causes without harming their, their mental health. Today, you know, this episode, that's what it's about. That's what we're trying to cover. And when you talk about knowing how much it impacts us from day-to-day, -day, that statement that you shared, uh, that you just gave, um, the, the stat that you just gave, 51% of our state in South Carolina is female. 51%. But we're making decisions that affect them and they're not being properly represented. That's, uh, as, you, as you say, it's not fair. So it's part of that on the voters or... Oh, there's a. The, and then that's part a, of it. You got another podcast to talk about that? <laughs> we could come up with one. There's I'm another sure. Another hour, another <laughs> three hours, we could talk on that. Uh, but let me let me. Continue. Are women running though? Too, I guess. I was just, are women running as well? I guess. They have, and in fact, uh, in this last election, it was rather unique in that South Carolina lost seven black female wow. uh, representatives. Mm. Wow. So they lost. They lost race. They lost the gender, and uh, that's that's where the trend was. It was a, a pretty brutal election. So there were females running, there were black representatives running. Um, but I will tell you just from studying the data, uh, we had a representative here in Greenwood, Representative Ann Parks, mm -hmm. a longtime servant, served for decades, doing good Shout work out. for the people. Shout out, mm -hmm. Ann Parks. Uh, she lost her election to a, a brand new newcomer. Nobody knew who he was, and, and, and he just had an R next to his name. <laughs> and uh, next thing you know, she lost by 600 votes. Now, I want to tease that out a little bit. Um, lost by 600 votes. Now, her territory covers all of McCormick County, mm -hmm. as well as the part of Greenwood County that comes up and around the city of Greenwood. Mm -hmm. So her, I can't speak to McCormick. It's, it's, a, it's a conservative county. But I can speak to Greenwood. Her districts that she covers in Greenwood are predominantly black Americans. Says a lot. But they turned out, only 27% of them turned out to vote mm. in the 22 election. Says Statewide, the average was 52%. Her precincts, they showed up, her voters showed up 20-something percent. That and, needs to be a headline somewhere. Yes. Now, you talk about what's the blame on that. You can't give it just one cause. Do you blame the voters? Well, were the voters inspired to come out? There's more than Ann Parks running on the ticket. You had a governor's race. You had a U.S. Senate race. You got all these other people. Did the voters know any of them that might have caused them to say, hey, I'm going to give up my Tuesday, go out and vote or vote early? You know, did we as a county party get out in the streets enough and engage with them enough to get them excited the months before the election? Probably not. Were those voters educated themselves? Do they care? Probably not. Hmm. So there's a lot of different That's reasons that go into it, and these are all things that we can't just give up and point fingers. We got to address it head on. Now, there's also, and I know this is another topic you wanted to talk about, gerrymandering. Hmm. Yeah, I, I do want to. I do want to. Can you just break that down into layman's this terms? Affects, Please, that yeah. affects directly the Ann Parks election. So mm -hmm. I'm going to lay some numbers on you. This is interesting. So gerrymandering is the technique by which the group that draws the lines 
of the districts and the counties and so on. They manipulate those lines in such a way that they get to retain the power that they have. Now, gerrymandering isn't a Republican thing. It isn't a Democrat thing. It's a power thing. Power thing, yeah. Right? The Democrats in New York are gerrymandering as much as the Republicans in the South. Mm -hmm. All right? So they draw the line. So even if statewide 45% of the voters voted for a Democratic governor, yet 80% of the House representatives are Republican, that tells you by carving up the districts, you can manipulate the representation at the local level. Mm. So there's a lawsuit that actually occurred at the congressional level. South Carolina has seven congressional seats that sit in the U.S. House. Part of the redistricting that happened in 2021 involved District 1, which is along the coast, and District 6, which is more in the Charleston area. Right? Mm -hmm. District 1 it has Representative Nancy Mace, a Republican, District 6 is Representative James Clyburn, mm -hmm. all right, he's a Democrat. Democrat yeah. During redistricting, they took, and this redistricting is done by the, the South Carolina representatives, they took 68% of the black population in Charleston County out of District 1, put them into District 6 with James Clyburn. Mm. Let's talk about what that did to those black voters. James Clyburn was always going to win his district. Right. It's not competitive. The way it was to begin with, he always was going to get the vote and was going to win. Mm -hmm. District 1 was competitive. Before Nancy Mace was there, there was Joe Cunningham, a Democrat. Mm -hmm. All right, Nancy Mace flipped it in 2020. All right, so it's a, it's a uh, I would call that a purple county. It can go either it way. It can go back and forth. But in 2021, when you take 68% of the black vote in one county, the tens of thousands of people that were moved out from one to the other, Nancy Mace won it in 2022 by a landslide. That's, re that's gerrymandering. That's where the power of drawing the line dilutes the voting power of a small particular group and says, guess what? Your vote doesn't have the power that it used to. So, now you, you so you it's not about you know, Democrat or Republican. It's about power. But I guess in that case, the Republican, the conservative you know, folks have the power right. there. And that's why they... So the know. NAACP filed a lawsuit. Okay. Saying they Shout out. racially gerrymandered those mm -hmm. lines mm. And, uh, and affected the outcome of an election. And federal court agreed and said, South Carolina, you must redraw those lines. Now, you're allowed to redraw draw the lines for any reason whatsoever, but you cannot use race. Mm -hmm. And while the House representatives uh, denied that race was a factor, 68% of the black vote getting moved is a little bit of a hint that race was involved. So they in the process the court, of... The court pulled out um, all sorts of text messages, emails. Mm -hmm. They saw the smoking guns that you and I don't have privy to and says, yeah, race was a factor. That is an illegal line draw. We must redo it. So they are in the process of um, d drawing the lines again? Uh, it hasn't begun yet, but they have been okay. ordered to do so. And, you know, you said earlier... Um, this can happen with Republicans, it can happen with Democrats. Who are the people from year to year uh, that are in control of coming up with, oh, we need to redraw the lines, and this is what well, we Well, it's do. not year after year. It's every 10 years. Every 10 years. So it okay. happens when the census occurs, then you get to reapportion things. Maybe populations have shifted. And, okay. You know, one county or one area got smaller than the other. Uh, let me give one other example, because it happened here in Greenwood. This gerrymandering happen here in Greenwood? Oh, by Lake Greenwood. And not there so much, because oh. that's always been heavily conservative area. Okay. I want to talk about Ann Parks' district. Mm -hmm. Wow. Because Ann Parks, District 12, got redrawn. And mm -hmm. if you look at the before and after map, it actually looks quite similar, right? I mean, they look at it and go, well, there's no crazier lines than was there before. Now, Ann always had all of McCormick County, and her territory expanded in Greenwood a bit. So you take the city of Greenwood and then you expand around parts of 96 and so mm -hmm. on. So she grew a little bit outwards. Well, let's talk some numbers. And this was just eye-opening. Before redistricting, Ann Parks had 13,230 black residents of voting age. So 13,200 black residents of voting age. Doesn't mean they were registered to vote. Doesn't mean they all got out to vote. But of the possible voters, 13,000. After redistricting, she actually gained more. It was up to 14,000. Mm -hmm. So she gained 800 
potentially new black voters. Prior to redistricting, she had 11,700 potential white voters over the age of 18. After redistricting, 14,800. <laughs> a gain of 3,000. And she lost. So, so let's, let's just recap here. After this, redistricting, she gained 850 potential black voters. Right. She also gained 3,100 potential white voters. She lost by 600, 600. votes. Yeah. <laughs> wow. 600 votes. Now, again, I need to make this caveat. Is it simple as this? Does every white voter vote white? Does every black voter vote black? No. no. Does every person who could vote, do they actually vote? No. So there's other factors at work. 850 versus 3,100. That and was redistricting that happened right here, and it changed the outcome of an election from an experienced black woman being your representative to a newcomer white male who was not, or who, who got elected afterwards. So this is our number one priority to flip that back, because even with this change, you know, the numbers are still there and we think it's very winnable, but this is what people in power can do to secure it and chip away at that representation that the state has. And that's all gonna affect your mental health. Yeah. Right. You know, I want to talk about that That's mental health because you brought that up and this is a mental health broadcast. So yeah. I will share this with you. In my short experience, which goes back to 2016 of being in politics, I've gone through some mental health mood swings. Mm -hmm. yeah, I'm very involved on the social media. Mm -hmm. So I see the Facebook, I see Twitter. I'm engaged on all of those platforms as well. And it is so easy to get sucked in, mm -hmm. right? Where you just want to fight everybody. I see this anonymous guy on Twitter post something <laughs> hateful, and I just want to put on my boxing gloves and hit the keyboard and type something nasty back at him. I've had people I've worked with who just dropped out. They were very active, and they just get too caught up in the emotions of what they see on mm -hmm. TV. Mm -hmm. It is hard to be effective and not internalize everything, mm -hmm. right? And, and that's a, a skill that I actually had to develop over the years even when I decided to run for office, I had some nasty stuff said about me, man. Mm -hmm. Nasty stuff. Did it affect me? No. It did not. Because I knew what to expect. I knew that these people who said that stuff have no impact on my life, and I was able to let it roll right off me and not engage them, and I can completely ignore them. That is a skill that has to be developed. Well, how, how, did, your, how did your kids take you ran in, and your family? That's um, a good question. That's a great question. You know, <laughs> yeah. uh, I'll share this with you. My wife's a Republican. Mm -hmm. All right? She's always voted Republican, and I think I was probably the first Democrat vote she's ever made because she mm -hmm. knows me, mm -hmm. right, and, and some of her <laughs> family. Uh, and, and when I decided that I needed to run and wanted to step up and, and let this uh, position and platform be heard, the first person I asked for permission was her, because <laughs> right? I knew this, was, this could impact her. Mm -hmm. uh, fortunately, it did not have, ultimately it did not have an impact. In fact, you know, um, I've got two grown kids, uh, so they were just tickled pink. You know, they, they, they just loved the fact that I was running, they supported me. I've got two younger stepdaughters. In fact, one of my stepdaughters, uh, 19, and this was the first time she ever got to vote. Mm. And she got to, to cast a vote for me, which was great. <laughs> uh, I have a, a, another stepdaughter. She's uh, younger. She's in middle school. Uh, and she just thought it was cool seeing my signs up everywhere. <laughs> and she would always come home and tell me, I saw your sign on this corner. I saw your sign on that corner. Uh, but for the most part, when my wife would go into work and, and people were more curious, they're like, wow, your husband's running for office. And I ran what I thought was a very decent, honest, forthcoming campaign. I tried not to get caught up in the hype and in the slogans and in the catchphrases, but actually deal with issues, deal with facts and data, and keep a calm, cool demeanor about it mm -hmm. without sounding like a crazy person. Uh, and so people were more interested in what was going on and seeing, hey, I know Bill, he walks his dog. He's running for office? Cool. Mm -hmm. you know, and, and I thought that was a lot of fun and, and made it worthwhile. So when we talk about political issues, right, um, and I know you gave us some stuff that's, that's relevant to South Carolina, we know like some of the bigger issues. Are there any in South Carolina that you know that's just, I guess, kind of relevant to South Carolina, really big in South Carolina? 
issues. Yeah, and, and this is where I think the biggest disappointment about running for office last year really comes to fruition. So when I, when I look at what are the issues in South Carolina, there's, there's two types of issues. I'll call them real issues, and mm -hmm. the second one are emotional opinion issues. Mm -hmm. So real issues are things like childhood poverty, the fact that we rank among the worst in the nation mm. for childhood poverty. The fact that we rank some of the worst in the nation for maternal health care, and especially black women who have three times the, the, the uh, infant mortality rate than their white counterparts in the state. There is, we, we've got um, childhood death due to gun violence, fifth worst rate in the country right here, ninth worst overall for all gun violence death is here in South Carolina. So I look at issues like that, where you're talking about income and health care and, and racial equality. And then you look at what the state General Assembly actually is working on, mm -hmm. their top priorities this year, constitutional carry. <laughs> Being able to carry guns without any licensing or, or, um, or, or safety requirements or any type of education. The priority that they got through was on abortion, defining life as beginning at the moment of conception, that they get more protection than the living do. Um, their number one priority also this year was education suppression, uh, where they wanted to have this anti-critical race theory mm -hmm. mantra. It, it, give me a second. I want to talk to you about that critical race theory for a minute because it just blows my mind. What has happened in politics in this country is that one group has used catchphrases without meaning. Catchphrases like CRT, catchphrases like parental rights, catchphrases like religious liberty, you know, and, and, and parental choice. These are catchphrases that they never come out and actually define, which allows their general population to fill in the blanks mm. with whatever prejudice or preconceptions they have. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna take just one example, that critical race theory, right? Now, I can't say I'm an expert on it because I haven't gone to graduate school or law school to study the economic theories, the theories of law, the theories of legislation that cascade down the decades that lead to situations that we find ourselves in today. It's a very complex topic. It's about systems. It is complex with a lot of interconnecting systems mm -hmm. that quite frankly, I'm not smart enough to get into yet because I haven't gone through that type of education. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, the legislators have decided to redefine CRT on their own. You take a look at the law they passed. They said, we will prohibit the teaching of critical race theory in any public schools. Then they go on and say, we define critical race theory as. Mm -hmm. They're going to define it. Mm -hmm. And they define it in such a way that has nothing to do with actual critical race theory. They use vague terms like, anything that makes one race feel uh, superior to another, or anything that makes one race feel um, burdened or to blame for the past, or anything of that sort, which has nothing to do with actual critical race theory. So to me, the politics that are winning in our country today is not based on facts, honesty, truth, data, but it's based more on emotions and, mm -hmm. and, and the prejudices and allowing it to come to light. And to me, that's probably the most discouraging thing about this Very. is that they want to enact a law and redefine terms, even redefine terms like patriotism. You know, Patriotism is no longer about loving your country. It's about accepting what I believe. And if you don't believe what I believe, then you're not a patriot. And redefining those ways those terms in a way that serves certain populations. That's right. Mm -hmm. So um, serves the ones who are <laughs> who are redefining it. <laughs> so with all the things that we've talked about, one one way to uh, I guess address those would be to vote. But what are other ways that individuals um, can get involved? It's an excellent question. Voting. Gosh, there are there are countries out there. I think Australia is one, where voting is mandatory. You don't vote, you're fined. 
Now it's like 20 bucks. It's a small amount. Oh, but wow. you incur a fine if you don't vote. <laughs> there are some countries that have mandatory voting. I'm almost of an opinion that as a citizen of the United States, one of your sacred obligations is to get out there and vote. Mm-hmm. You know, that, that should just be requirement number one. Uh, but, but second, you know, running for office really is the only thing. How do we change things? The only way to change things is to put in elected leaders who align with those values you have. Mm -hmm. Nothing is going to change. You can hold all the protests you want. You can write all the letters you want. You can make all the phone calls you want. Guess what? You're not going to change most people's minds, most of the legislators' minds. Not at all. I have seen where, um, on this critical race thing, they held public forum in Colombia Mm -hmm. where people could come in and speak on the topic, citizens, Mm -hmm. and talk to the panel for both for or against. And when it came to the critical race theory, the room was packed with people who came in all over the state and one after another after another spoke against the legislation that was being proposed. In fact, one of the representatives said, just a quick survey, how many of you here are to speak against this? And everybody in the room raised their hand. Everybody in the room. Only one person actually got up and spoke in favor of it. Mm -hmm. That panel voted overwhelmingly to pass that legislation and move it on, right? So you, so you see, you're not going to affect a lot of minds. The only way you're going to affect is to put them out of office mm. and put other people in. So work on a campaign. If you can't run yourself, man, I'm just a schlub off the street. I decided to run to kind of demystify it. Anybody can run. In fact, I became friends with this lady from Missouri. I want, she ran for house just like I did. I'm going to read a quote from her that, that just blew me away. She, oh, says, yeah. Yeah. she, she said, <laughs> run for office. Her name is Jessica Piper. She was a, a Missouri State House candidate. She said, run for office. Trust me, you have no need for any imposter syndrome. There are so many absolute goobers sitting in state houses across the country. <laughs> you are qualified. <laughs> and ladies and gentlemen, let me tell you, she is absolutely right. Right? Yeah. There is nothing special about those men and women who are sitting in state office. They are just like you and me. They really are. And in some cases, they are nut jobs, absolute goobers. And we definitely have the right to sit in those seats just like anybody else. But if you can't join a campaign, and if you don't want to run for yourself, find one issue then that's important to you. If it's voting rights, if it's women's like rights, that. if it's elderly rights, whatever it is, pick one issue. Don't get overwhelmed with the f- solving all the world's problems. Pick one and join a group and focus on that. And that's a great way you can make a difference. I really like that. So if you learn nothing else from this part, this episode, run for office. Anybody can do it. (laughs) Anybody can do it. And you know what? If you are run curious, you can give me a holler. Okay. I'll, I'll walk you through every step of the way. Anybody can do it. I did not spend a ton of my own money to do it. I want to demystify a lot of this. Uh, if you've got a good message, if you've got a strong personality, people will step up and support you. That's probably the, the biggest eye-opener. I thought I was just going to be a lone voice. Man, when I had hundreds of people putting signs out for me, when I had several hundred you know, putting in donations uh, from all across the state, not just here in Greenwood, mm. you, know, you find supporters everywhere, and it, it's, it, it motivates you to work even harder. All right, Bill. We're coming to an end. Um, well, we're gonna we have to have started. you. What you <laughs> about me coming to an end? We're gonna have to it's have you back day, right? for a, a part two, three, four, and five. Yes, sir. Um, but uh, just give us um, your uh, closing thoughts. No, I, first of all, I want to thank you, uh, uh, Kervin and, and Jeff, for everything you guys are doing. This this podcast is amazing. I've been a fan of it for a long time, as you know. Yeah. Uh, and so I think the work that you're doing, the the issue that you focus on, mental health. Mm-hmm. is at the core of a lot of problems in our society today, and it is a fixable issue. And it really takes education, it takes devotion, uh, and anything I can do to partner with you on that message, I will do so. So I'm going to leave you with a little shout-out and, and kudos to you. I appreciate that. Uh, you're doing that. a great job, so well, thank you for that. Where can we find you at on social media? Man, uh, I tell you what, Kimler, K-I-M-L-E-R, is not a common name. So if you do some Google searching, you'll find me. <laughs> you search on Twitter, Instagram, uh, YouTube, Facebook, whatever. I haven't gotten to TikTok yet. I need some education on that. I don't know how to dance, so I haven't gotten on TikTok. You don't have to dance. All right, that's good. Same thing you do you on can Instagram. You, to, you could do a uh, uh, TikTok, but yeah, you can <laughs> if you but want if you to. Just type in K I M L E R. You are going to find all my social medias, um, and, and feel free to get involved and reach out to me that way. Okay. 
Uh, but thank you, man. Thank you for taking it, uh, being with us, uh, sharing um, your plethora of knowledge. My pleasure. Uh, again, uh, I do see foresee you uh, coming back on. Um, you know, all of these other podcasts and shows that have their resident uh, person for mental health, resident person for politics. You might have to be our person for politics. We have to have a... Uh, hey, uh, you got my vote. Yeah. <laughs> I just need you to move back to Greenwood. Yeah. 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 Well, uh, I'll try to get some people to vote for you. How about that? Um, I'll try to help out on that front. So let's, let's talk about it. The platform. Go check uh, Joshua out on YouTube, YouTube. Uh, where he have these questions. Um, Bill, if you haven't checked that out, check his out. He's usually, you know, four or five minutes, maybe six, seven, um, where he's um, giving questions to people. Random people. Random, random people, people about yeah. life, health, family, culture, making people think, thought-provoking um, questions. Uh, so check him out on, on his platform, on YouTube and other social medias. Hey, shout out to your cameraman, too. You're going to make me look good. Right? Winston. Yeah. All right. <laughs> shout out to Winston. Um, you can check Winston out on Winston, St- Winston J. Stewart. Uh, dot com. He's uh, take care of all our audio and visual needs. Um, also follow Speaking with Gravity on on Instagram, yes, TikTok, Facebook. Uh, if you have event needs, check out Six One Event Rentals. Um, they got a three hundred and sixty booth with the red carpet. Um, visit Code at Ready, um, where D will help you navigate the unexpected and challenging transitions of life through um, solution focus. Uh, avenues and then gravity counseling group um, try to have a wellness group every fourth monday of the month uh, for men for men i got to get you out there uh, on bill uh, and we talk about um, various things um, connected with mental health resilience emotional intelligence relationships healthy relationships so on and so forth thank you all for taking the time to listen you can be anywhere doing anything and not listening to us, but you chose to listen to us, and we appreciate that. Uh, remember, I'm a therapist, but this isn't therapy. It's a podcast. Mm-hmm.